All right, so um, we're, we're running like about four hours ahead of time, aren't we, Sarah? We've dropped off that lady from Ibeck. And um, so you've got me. So um, my name's Pete Williams, but um, you know, as we said, I'm at Rexter on Twitter. And I've noticed an absolute fail in the amount of tweets coming out here. So everyone's looking at their screens, but from what I can see, they're all bloody doing email. So um, that's crap. That's not good enough. Um, now, I was told to use curtain ampersand, or curtain T ampersand L, but the problem is if you use an ampersand and a hashtag, it cuts it off. So we're using curtain T and L. I've put a few tweets, so if there's any great pearls of wisdom, you should tweet them. Um, so, uh, I suppose, I, I, my background is I'm a chartered accountant, so uh, of, of the obvious choice to, uh, choice to talk about gaming, but I actually started doing stuff with the web in 1993, and I thought this is much more exciting than accounting. And um, I founded a business called Deloitte Digital, which is now probably the biggest web mobile development company in the world and we have people in 15 countries. So um, I think we're about to open in France, so um, we're just in Japan. So, it's, um, so I've been in this game for a long time. Um, and through that, I've been very interested in gaming. And I was one of these um, people who felt that I've got three kids who are all finished um, their sort of education, more or less. Uh, one's still doing uni, one's in the third year of a gap year. Um, so um, <laughs> the, uh, the my, my view was that the, the web was going to change everything and my approach to that with my kids was to use them as um, guinea pigs to test what happens when you give kids technology before they can walk and make sure that when any new gaming console or thing comes out that you um, line up at midnight outside electronics to protect and buy it. The ring I've got, are you, have you backed the ring? Are you buying one? Yeah. Yeah, so you, you see this thing, it all just happens. So very, very much about immersive technology and one of the things that um, I suppose I thought about my kids in gaming was that, um, you know, I was the sort of parent would be, what are you doing out there playing with a little get back in and start playing with computers, you losers, you know. Uh, so I actually built, I didn't have enough room in the house to run multiplayer LAN games so I actually converted my roof into a four plasma screen multi synced up Xboxes and my house was the world's most popular house. But I, I, I started to observe um, gaming and education just in terms of the way that the kids learnt. So um, when I looked at how, how they formed teams, how they, how they learnt leadership, how they, how they used after action reviews to reform teams and could, get, could basically come together and perform at an elite level in minutes, I found it quite amazing. And I looked at the education I had, which um, most of the time I was one of those smart ass kids, too smart for their own good and just sort of could do the work and then disrupt everybody. Uh, I wasn't engaged at all but sort of could do it. One of my kids is one of those kids who will, if that's the rules, I follow the rules, the other two are a little bit more like me. If I'm not interested, um, I'll try and disrupt it. Um, so, so I sort of came at this sort of notion of gaming and education, perhaps from a, a little bit of a different thing. Um, the other thing is I now run a thing called Centre for the Edge in Australia. What, um, what it is, is there's a guy called John Seely Brown. He's sort of famous because he was the director of Park Xerox for 25 years. And, you know, the sort of people who bought you Windows or the first graphical user interface and the mouse and stuff like that. Another guy called John Hagel, who uh, sort of a bit of an internet luminary futurist author type guy. And we're very interested in, um, I suppose we do research, but we don't quote what every other bug has done before. That's I don't know, you know when you read academic research, they were like, you know, and this guy said, I don't give a shit what he said. What have you done? What are you doing? So, may not be quite the academic model, but that's not really what we're about. We're about sort of <coughs> uncovering interesting things and looking at what's happening on the edges of society, often driven by uh, digital in infrastructure, by hyperconnectivity, and look at how things are changing, how they're doing rapidly. So, in that theme, we actually felt that the whole world sort of has focused for a lot of years on what we call scalable efficiency. You know, we will, you know, there's a way of doing this stuff, we'll create a process and everyone will follow it and it'll be all very efficient and um, that's great. Except along came the web and we start to see this explosion of people learning, collaborating, making stuff, doing stuff. So we said, well, is it, is the sort of normal thing of learning where we, you know, we talk about this S curve, you, know, you get a bit of traction for a while, once you, you sort of get into it, you might go up pretty quick but then you sort of flatten off and diffuse. 
So we started to think about the notion of exponential learning and could we find somewhere where it was happening where it wasn't scaling efficiency but it was scaling learning in a continuous exponential fashion. And where we landed was the world of Warcraft. So, um, so we did some research and we came up with this notion of the collaboration curve. And the notion was that we could actually observe exponential rates of learning uh, in certain communities, um, and open source communities we see the same, developer communities we often see the same, um, big wave surfing we see it, um, but World of Warcraft is where we started. And the key elements for that sort of stuff, one, there's a key, clear context. So I'm often, people often talk to me about games and education and I often say, well, unless you've got real understanding about how to create a compelling game, um, and you know, we talk about this notion of big G gamification, like turn something into a game, my standard response is don't even think about it. Uh, it's, you know, unless you're sort of really committed, you've got really good game developers or you can access a community or build it for you, I'd stop at using the models of uh, gaming. But again, some ways you can bring competition in gaming into stuff without necessarily having to fully turn it into a you know, live multiplayer action game. And I think what um, yeah, from Justin from Imagination just showed us that actually the, the sort of using gaming controllers, effectively a VR headset as well as an Xbox thing, we can do a lot of interesting stuff which does bring the 3D world to life and actually has consequences of adrenaline and environment that we wouldn't normally get. So we need a clear context. The other one for exponential learning particularly is we need low barriers to entry. We need it to be easy to start. So if we think about the notion of a game like uh, Draw Something, it's very easy, low barriers to entry, a lot of diversity, anybody can play. Um, but the thing is, the notion for exponential learning is we want a lot of participants. We want that room to scale up. The other one is a culture of trust, sharing and transparency. And, and this is where I think, in my own opinion, might disagree, but that sort of learning is all based on original short. The shit, you know, it's like, oh, you must, you can't play, you can't steal anything. It's like, as soon as we get people out of universities, I've got to convert the heads to go and use whatever is existing there. Do not rebuild invented wheels. Build on top of them. You know, steal with pride. You know, <laughs> steal shamelessly. Take what others have done and build on top of it. Stack innovation on top of what's gone before. Not come up and come up with original thought and everything that started from scratch. Um, the other thing is, if you do good stuff, share it. Um, IP shared is much better than IP controlled. Um, and be transparent. You know, let's not be be real. Make information available so we can all learn from it. The other one is real-time personal feedback. If we look in the corporate world, or perhaps even often in the educational world, we don't get real-time personal feedback. Uh, so I'd imagine with SIM school, I can, as a student, come in and see how I'm going across my back ocean models and you know my scoreboard and all that stuff after a thing. So I use the term personal dashboards a lot. Platforms for knowledge flow and sharing. H how are we connecting around this? Are we open? You know. Is SIM school developed with an open API so students can say that's great but we're going to build something on top of it? I don't know what it is but it should. Uh, and fun and engagement. So again, th so they're the, the context. So let's, um, that's the boring bullet point stuff. Let's go to some pictures. So if we think of World of Warcraft, it's an MMOG or an MPOG depending if you like to add player and role in it um, <coughs> and it exhibits exponential learning. So you can sort of level one low barrier to entry, you know, you sort of like that Oculus Rift thing learn to wander around and get a feel for the controllers and do a few actions. Level 30, you've got five people. Level 70, you're in a guild and you're raiding. So we see this sort of gradual level of difficulty and starting to go from single player to teams and then to whole raid parties. Are there any WoW players in here? One, yeah. So, what, were you in a guild? How often did you raid? And what sort of role did you tend to play? I think. There you go. Watch your, watch your wallet. You're not from New Zealand, eh? Uh, good, you'll be safe. Um, so, do any queries in the audience? Um, the, the, um, the other thing is that when we have this notion of exponential learning, there's sort of what we can learn um, through what's codified or explicit, but then there's also what we can learn through doing, and also what we can learn through what others have done, and importantly, what we can learn through what others have shared. So we start to see the sort of build up outside the game of these learning networks. So there's a whole raft of different forums, communities, people sharing all this stuff and you know, or guilds have their own little social network or forum and then they might start to see that other guilds are going into more open forums and um, you, know, you might be in a guild, a new developer 
one of the big pains in the arts in a, a guild is that you have 25, you might have I don't know, 150 members in a guild, you have about 25 members in a raid, scheduling everybody to be there at the right time. So, you know, suddenly if I've got 25 thieves but no wizards or healers or whatever, I, I'm going to get killed. So, uh, so the whole scheduling piece, so somebody develops a, um, like a resource planning scheduling tool and they use it for their guild and they say, oh, well, you know, actually this is good for everyone else and they share it. So it's not about saying, I will keep everything to myself. It's about everybody sharing as much as they can so everybody learns. So you create this ecosystem of learning. Um, in terms of participants, at the time we did this study uh, across, um, really we did it over a number of years with Park Xerox, but um, over at around 2007, it was the biggest mPOL going out there. Um, what else was there? RuneScape, Final Fantasy, EverQuest, E Online, some of these still live. Um, but it had about 10 million participants, so there was a mass of them. So what we did was we took the data from as many World of Warcraft servers as we could find to see what actually happens and you know, how do people learn. So the first thing we looked at was how many hours do we need to accumulate to gain experience points up to level 70. Once you're up to level 70, you're sort of a, you know, this is sort of newbie levels. This is sort of starting to get harder. This is like, hey, I'm a, a guilt, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good player. You know, I'm main, you know, I can go higher and be an absolutely elite. But so we sort of found this notion of accumulation of hours to get to experience point. But the thing that we found more important was that over that same period of time, the time and the rate that people learned had improved 200%. So effectively, as this learning network and as this ecosystem built and as more and more stuff was shared, the ability of people to come in and learn from each other, you know, join a guild and, you know, I've, I've got to my sort of level 30s and stuff and now I'm going to get serious and join a guild or somebody invites me to a guild and I'm learning from everyone around them, around me, plus other guilds and are sharing stuff. It's like suddenly we can create this exponential learning model and from what we can see, it didn't slow down, it didn't diffuse. Some, some notions of the stuff that people share. So rather than just you know, videos of gameplay and stuff which people share all over the place, this was a spreadsheet for man managing your sort of minimum and maximum strategies for um, damage points, is that what it's called? Damage points, yeah. So you might sort of have a theoretical capacity to do 1,400 damage points, but we suck the data out of the server and it says, you know what, mate, you're running at 950. Um, and there's a few reasons why that. Your team might not have the optimal mix of players which allows you to do what you need to do. You may not have the right tooling and equipment which actually lets you get this stuff. You get in this spreadsheet, these, you know, some geek somewhere who pulls the data because the data is open and accessible and with um, you know, uh, persistent structures, pulls that out, creates a spreadsheet which other guilds can then pick up and use. The, um, the other one, this is a uh, after action review performance log with all the members of the team, how did they go, what did they do. Again, this is shared from one of the guilds. And again, the notion there is that if we think of when we look at gamers play, the first thing you do is after you have a raid or if you're playing Halo or it's eight a side or whatever, at the end of it you stop and you look at the stats. Who did well? You know, what number of kills did I, I get? What number of deaths did I get? You know, what sort of killing sprees or rampages I've gone and if you're not gamers, doesn't matter, you sort of get the thing. As killing sprees, like I think you kill three, a rampage or something, you get five in a row or something like that. Um, but again, these tools are being shared where, you know, we get this real-time feedback. And a lot of times in learning, we sort of get, you know, go do this assignment or, you know, worse still for students is like go and do a group exercise, which means if I'm one of these C people, the conscientious, wasn't it? You know, it's like that means, you know, out of four people, one will do most of the work, one will do some of it, one might even sort of turn up and one will just be a pain in the ass and get confused, you know. And um, you're sort of looking, I, just, I know that uh, my kids, two of my kids have gone to university and the various partners and stuff, you know, the group exercise is like hell. You know, people prefer to slash their wrists and do it because there's no visibility or transparency of who's doing what. Although I, I'm, I'm actually an age prof at um, RMIT and I do some stuff with the entrepreneurship students Everything we do there is in a Yammer social network. So I can tell by the posts who's doing work all the way through. So it's interesting. Again, just because there's this transparency and it's like if it didn't happen in Yammer, it doesn't exist. Um, so I can actually see who's doing what and then pull a student aside. You know what, mate, I can see you're not doing anything. Um, or sometimes it would be there'd be an international student with the Aussie students and you could say, look, I can tell that they're probably being excluded a little bit through language. See if you can find stuff that actually they're good at and they can do. And, you know, 
part of what we're going to learn here is how to work in multicultural groups. So again, I used to find that as well. So it wasn't always that they were a bludger. Sometimes it was just that they couldn't understand. Um, so again, being more of an, a doer than a researcher, I, um, I took that world of Warcraft research and said, how can I apply that? So rather than sort of spend 600 hours or whatever to go into a guild, I said, where there's something easy accessible I can try. So I thought Angry Birds Space. So I thought to myself, can I become a top 100 player in Angry Birds space? And the rating that I would use would be the Apple Game Center because most people are using it through an iOS device or Game Center. So it was about 2 million players. Um, so what did I do? I first sort of played through most of the levels. Myself got through to the three stars, which is a little bit time consuming, but not that hard. But then I joined the Angry Birds Nest. So the Angry Birds Nest is a community that has quite a number of participants who share everything, but the number one thing I use is the personal dashboard. So it's maybe a bit hard to see here, but if you look at it, um, at level 1.1, 1 .1, my score is 2,950. I'm 59 points above the average, but I'm only 1,000 points off the highest score ever, and I'm ranked 1143. Now I could get my ranking up if I could get another 50 points of that, but effectively I'm that close to the highest score ever. There's no value there. But I come down here, you know, some of them I'm ranked 44th of all time or whatever. But um, I look down here and there's one which has got a delta of 17,000 points. So to me, so I look at I'm, I'm 7,500 points above average, but there's 17,000 points there. There's a strategy there that I haven't been able to work out. So that's where I'm going to get the most advantage. That's where I'm going to get the learning. So that's where I go. The other thing about this sort of personal dashboard, again, I can look at it and I can see where it's at. Uh, again, it's real time. It's based on the information that I'm generating. The other thing is I can join in a social discussion around the level and sort of say, you know, well, what, do I, what am I going to do here? You know, it's very challenging. You can do a one birder, which is use one angry bird to knock out the whole lot, but you actually won't maximise the scores there. So you're better off to do a three birder, all that sort of stuff. So we have this social discussion about iterations and things we're trying. So we effectively take the tacit knowledge or the experiments that we do and we share them with the rest of the community. And over time, we come up with the optimal things. Now, if that's cheating or plagiarising, probably is. An academic, well, for me, I don't give a shit. I, I uh, wanted to be ranked in the top 100 when I got to number 85 and thought that's enough. <laughs> but, um, but I reckon being ranked 85 out of 2 million ain't bad. Uh, and it proved this sort of notion and this theory that if you do get in and participate, if you share, if you have personal dashboards, if you have the ability to sort of pinpoint where you need to work the hardest or perhaps where there's something you haven't understood, you can actually become good. Um, another environment that we've seen where it works really well now, I hate SAP with a passion. Okay, just to, if you don't know what SAP is, it's a German software product that has infected most of the large corporations in the US and everyone hates. But um, notwithstanding that, what they did is uh, around 2004 they moved from a clunking, horrible software package to make it a bit more open and they've got a developer network. So um, really, again, this shows the number of um, points by thousands that have been um, accumulated, so that's effectively, you know, I shared a comment, I rated something, I contributed some software, whatever, and over a period of time, the number of users. So what we saw is over a period of four years, that went from about 100,000 people to 1.4 million people, most of whom were outside the organisation. So again, instead of thinking, what do we know, there's a huge number of teams out there who have got this stuff installed and are working around running it and developing it and working on it. We've got our own people. But can we scale that community up to really drive some huge change? And which is effectively sort of saying, by being open, there's a clear context around it. I've scaled the participants. I've gamified it a bit with points and things like that. And that has seen a sort of massive surge in the ability to deploy new software from a company like SAP. The, um, and the sort of way we look at it is this notion of, you know, there's explicit knowledge sort of down here. There's tacit knowledge over here, contained and scalable. So we look at things like teams who are working together in a contained environment. They may not be participating with the rest of the world or a learning network, but they come up here to this sort of scalable tacit knowledge learning network and sometimes they can come in with you know, groups like Innocentive or Kaggle. Do you know Kaggle? Kaggle's about 100,000 data scientists that have been built into a community and they run competitions. So um, like NASA ran one for um, can you can you measure the expansion rate of the universe? So, you know, Hawking, oh, no idea, you know, and all that sort of stuff, and Einstein, all those dudes are trying to work it out. 
Um, some bloke called Martin O'Leary, a glaciologist from Cambridge, came in with, um, with the best algorithm in the first week. One of my employees, Rob Martin, um, the next week, and then some bloke called Deep Zot came in and just smashed everything out of the park that had ever been done before by the combined greatness of physicists around the world. So, again, you know, putting this information here, teams struggling with a problem, being able to join learning networks and go into people who've got explicit skills to be able to solve problems in a collaborative way. It's the way we're seeing exponential learning play out. In terms of the type of people that get involved, you might get beneficiaries and users. So you might sort of find some kid wanting to play Angry Birds and says, I will go on there because there's some good walkthrough videos. Um, you might have some observers who sort of get involved in the community but are watching and watching the conversation but don't say much. Um, you've got the commentators who you know, just mainly throw in comments but not so much original thought. You've got the creators who might be sharing videos and things like that. And then you've got people like Manu Marlin, who is the greatest Angry Birds player of all time. And if Manu comments on something you commented on, it's like, it's, it's just the ultimate. It's just, <laughs> life does not get better. But the, again, the leaders sort of emerge in terms of the ones creating new things, trying new things, doing new stuff. Other people, um, Easter, uh, she's a 35-year-old graphic designer from the Netherlands. Um, she probably does the best videos of um, Angry Birds in terms of at the elite level. So you know, you've got people providing that sort of stuff and, and you build these communities. And the key thing is, not everybody's going to be here and that's okay. It's a bit like Wikipedia, you know, whatever it is. One or two percent of people effectively do most of the work and then you've got a few people who might comment or talk about grammar or change a few things. But again, we can build a lot of learning without necessarily everybody trying to lead. Um, the other thing is this notion of trust-based interactions. Um, are people willing to share? Are people going to provide? Is there some sort of motivation that they've got? And, and I think it's interesting when you do work with either an open source model or a gaming community, it's almost like, well, the community's helped me get to where I've got. So if I actually do something and get the world's all-time best score, which I've done twice, I think I'm going to keep that separate. It's a bit like, you know what, that's an honour that's fleeting but I'll share it and then see if somebody can use that and pass it. You know. So again, and then can I sort of build in the rest of the world? So you start to look at things like, say, SAP, you had teams and companies and in the organisations, the developer network, you know, as a learning network, but suddenly I start to scale this up to a massive platform with 1.4 million people involved. Um, I'll jump through that. So how do we apply that in business? Um, a lot of the guys who were working for me would hack the Deloitte systems to make them actually usable and look good. Um, and they kept getting in trouble because they were production systems. So in the end, I said, you know, the problem here is that our IT departments, you know, they're actually not bad, but internal IT departments aren't sort of renowned for, you know, breakthroughs in great user-centred design and usability and making things beautiful. They tend to have a slightly internal focus. So I said, why don't we create a sandbox environment where my guys can go and build shit whatever they feel like, um, and IT, it's not going to affect your systems, and we'll have a lightweight governance model. If, if something starts to get traction, we'll whack it through the governance and production process. So we've got a thing called destined for production. It's like a trigger point where it's like, well, 500 people are using this heavily, bang, let's put it on some robust infrastructure and make it part of the, 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 the way things work. So again, you think about that, I've got a community. When, um, when I said to the guys that I had them off the hook for being in trouble and that they needed to build this thing, they said, what sort of budget have you got? It's like, it's an easy question, none. What do you mean done? So, well, if you're going to use, if you're going to do a blog, what would you use at home? WordPress, good, we'll use that. If you're going to have a wiki, what would you use at home? Media wiki, good, we'll use that. Um, if you're going to have a sandbox and you're going to have a development environment, what would you use? GitHub, good, we'll use that. We can do that, of course we can, you know, it's like free. So all this free stuff and, you know, a couple of designers got involved and then they make it beautiful. So, again, we just took these tools that are out there and exist and just whacked them together under a beautiful design. The next thing we did was we um, decided to have an event which actually brought in a bit of a game of competition which was a thing called Hack the Dot. It was basically come in or you know, join together at five o'clock, um, sleep in the office on, and give up your Friday night and most of your Saturday and build the crap that you want. Um, and if you win, you win some sort of prize. We actually had three prizes in the end, we gave out 19, but the point was we made it competitive, gamified it, highly shared. We used the social network to really enable the flow around it. So we actually, I, don't think, I think we had one meeting to organise this thing. We ended up having 400 people participate 
in eight white patients. It was all managed through Yammer, which is a social network, which is like an internal Facebook. But again, the whole model there was just put the stuff you're doing in there. Don't email people, don't, don't do whatever else people use, like paper and shit. Just, we've got a social network, let's make it work. Um, so again, we did it, we got 19 prototypes and, we have, and, and what we've done with each one of them is awarded 10 grand to actually go and take the prototype and make it more robust. So, um, so again, so we look at some of that sort of stuff and how we've applied it. Is there a strong context, you know? I often see people trying to develop games in an educational environment that, that are either sort of tangential or are more sort of passion projects of an individual to, because they want to make a game. Uh, is there a strong context around it? And, and that context can be making the call centre more efficient, it can be safety in the workplace, it can be make our systems better or it can be learning in a simulated environment. Can it scale? You know, if it's closed or I can't bring people in, if I can't sort of get this organic growth and I can't get the right diversity, it's probably not going to go. People are throwing money at me, that's how good this talk is. Um, the, the big question I've got, and I think I'll always struggle with this with academia, is the notion of, are we about learning here or are we about having to create original thought? You know, as I say, I have to rewire people who come out of universities to say, if it's already there, just use it and make it better. You know, not you know, you have to start from around. Don't make, I don't give a shit who did it before. Don't have to write 60 pages of acknowledgement. Just do something. You know, um, just get it out there. So a bit like the Sandy Edge community, it was new, but it was just leveraging off everything that was there before, freely available, all that stuff. So I, I don't know, maybe at a master's level you want all this stuff and what do you call those things? References? <laughs> yeah. And, but maybe for students it's like, I just really want them to come out and able to learn and use what's there to make amazing stuff. Um, how do we develop a community culture of sharing and ongoing development? So the Sandy Edge community, for example, is one where my people can come and build around anything. World of Warcraft, you can build your own sort of fields and places, can't you? you know, artefacts and all that stuff. Angry Birds, you can't go and build like your own Angry Birds games. But I'm thinking very much about if you are putting this stuff out there, can people take it and morph it and do stuff for it? Can you build a community to actually bring this thing to life? So think of the number of people building apps for um, you know, Apple's iOS or Google's Play Store, whatever, you know, can we get this sort of mass, mass creation of stuff by being open but by making it easier and easier by sharing how we've done it with everybody else? Think about what platforms you're providing for knowledge flow in your courses. You know, I, I say to people that nothing should be deployed with any technology unless there's social juxtaposed with it. Now, whether that's Yammer, whether it's forums, generally shit, but um, you know, I want people talking about what they see. I don't want them just, you know, too many times we see data visualisation systems, all this data and, oh, you can look at it this way and that, but what are people seeing? Can they say, hey, I, I looked at this or I drew down for that or, you know, I animated this and I thought this, what do other people think? So, again, this notion of learning is not just, you know, sort of computer provides data and you can look at it. It's like, can we get insight? Can we share? Can we talk? Can we learn? Um, how do we deliver real-time personal feedback? You know, if people are doing stuff in the classroom, one of my mates at RMIT, Christopher Cheong, he's written a paper about this. He brought in this um, thing of quizzes at the end of each class with um, like a mobile phone quiz. Uh, he said, you know, if I'd said to them, there is a test at the end of every class, there would be a revolt. I said, oh no, we've got a quiz game. It's like a quiz show and you fill in the thing and you have a leaderboard and all that sort of stuff. And he ran one class where he hadn't had time to prepare the quiz. The students revolted that they weren't, didn't have a test at the end of the class. But what it actually did was it made it interactive. It made them sort of want to compete and do well because, again, it was transparent. But it also highlighted, hey, the best student at this, this piece is this dude, so I've got a problem. You know, I've got a social network and discussion board where I can ask this person and we sort of learn off each other. Um, and, and how do we use the data that we get out of this stuff? You know, so again, we took the World of Warcraft data and we are able to look at it from the various ways of how long does it take people to learn this stuff. Uh, is there a rate of improvement? And you saw you know, the spreadsheets and the dashboards and all that stuff. You see that a bit with um, the sim school stuff, you know, I've taken this data, I'm not sure what you get out of the training thing, but you might sort of measure you know, how, many, how many practice goes did it take for somebody not to blow up a poor bloke in the, um, in the ute. Because I'm, I'm a smoker, I'm thinking, shit, don't tell me one of them likes to smoke. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Shit. Is that why they have a no smoking sign? But um, so anyway, that's um, that's some thoughts about what we're doing out there and researching out there in the the world of sort of immature, weird corporate people. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Thank you. So are we panelling or questioning? Yeah? I hope this yeah, is a good question, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of interesting because we, we do. What we find is there's a mass diversity in sort of what people do, where they're from. Gender skews a bit male. Age isn't, isn't skewed as young as you'd think. It's probably skewed a bit more sort of middle um, than you think. Uh, and, and it's a bit interesting. So it's like um, I'm talking about using fantasy football as a method of teaching particularly boys, maths, markets, all that stuff. I, don't know, I mean, I know this kid who's... Um, you know, dumb as dog shit he was when it came to maths and stuff, couldn't have two or two together. Man, you give him a fantasy football league, make it competitive with his brothers and his mates. Man, this guy knows everything about if I put that player in, I'll work at 4% more per percentage points at markets and stuff. Girls play the Sims a lot. So, yeah. again, you know, is there. Outside of kids, I've got girls and. Oh, they play Candy Crush a lot. Candy um, Crush, yeah. I mean, I just. Really Angry Birds, sort of. It. Yeah, but again, it's sort of, but again, it's the context and the engagement. So I'd either say, you know, there are games out there that I could say, if I had a group of girls, and again, it's not always black and white. You'll, you'll have some, you know, like some of the best Angry Birds games as a girl, these stars, for example. Um, but, you know, it's almost saying, well, you know, how do we pull it together? We've looked at a little bit around, um, we often find that girls are as interested in the social context of the game, uh, and they will find ways to make even single player games social. You know, talking to mates about them and all that stuff. So that's not bad. You know, again, if you can find something that's engaging for as many people as possible, and having a number of girls there who actually drive the social conversation and culture is fantastic. Other than a group of, you know, the, the typical, you know, overweight bearded nerd sitting in his um, computer room in the dark with a headset on, drinking coke and smoking dope. Um, it's, that's a bit of a, that's that's not true. It's like you have slim people who don't. Shade if you sit in the room, smoke dope, and drink coke all day and play games like Angry Birds. So it's, um, again, I, I think, yeah, I wouldn't, I'd just try stuff. Find what games work for what people. You know, are there things that are simple, low barriers to entry that can engage around a context? And you might find if you can engage people around why you're learning this stuff, like your, um, who was talking about the friction and the radial and all that stuff, you know, we're going to use Need for Speed uh, or Grand Theft Auto or something, girls like that because they can bash people. Um, the, you know, as a way of saying, well, this is how we're going to learn about this physics stuff. Okay. So I would say that the games are out there. Can I provide a context? Can I get people engaged around it? And can I get them to sort of join the dots, either initially explicitly or even tacitly start to say, ah, now I get why I'm doing this. Because in a teaching context, you don't just have girls or boys. So it's hard to um, imagine, you know, the scenario is that you're yeah. creating Yeah, I mean, I always just look at that as a problem to solve. And it might be that what you find is that, it, you know, again, massive gender stereotyping could be, well, actually what we find is that girls are really good at managing a guild because they're more social than they know what everyone's doing, whereas you might have some sort of, you know, Aspies type boy, all he's interested in is the technical and mechanics. So, again, you know, people often find their own roles. We, we, did, we did a study on a call centre called Live Ops, usually the call centre, yeah? So LiveOps uses, uh, uses all this sort of stuff around a call centre model and they've got a console which is effectively the game. But what has happened is there are a lot of people who used to actually work as call centre operatives who don't actually want to get paid anymore, they just want to curate the community. In, in business we call them loonies. So it's like I say, everyone, there was somebody with no life who just loves what you do and will work for you for free because that is the greatest thing. So I do work for a couple of football club We've got a heap of loonies, you know. I do work for a lot of people, or old retired chemical engineers. You know, they just want to talk shit about chemical engineering, you know, until they die. And even though you don't pay them, they will come and get involved. Or the National Semiconductor Web Bench Design Forum Committee, just electrical engineers with no lives who just want to retire and then talk about electrical engineering shit for the rest of their days. That's good. Old people, they're good. They work for free and they're happy about it. <laughs> That's the capitalist thing we're coming out.
who would say, you're going to spoil my pleasure, the pleasure I get out of playing games by making me play games in education, in an education context. Do you hear that? My son says that, and he plays Battlefield 4 a lot. Yeah. Well, don't tell him it's learning. Kidding. Leave it off. Don't like, tell him it's learning. It's like, yeah, I mean... But they'll know it is, because you're, you're in school, and, and the yeah, teacher's making you do it. Yeah, but it's like, you know, like, I don't know, when we were kids, you know, the class where you got to watch a movie. It's a bit like... You know, it's a bit like, oh, we're going to learn from this movie, whatever. I'm just going to watch this movie so I don't have to write down anything. You know, it doesn't feel like I'm working. So, right, so they won't feel like it's a choice. Yeah, so even if you say I'm going to use this, it's like, no, what I want you to do is, um, you know, you, who's the best, who's got the highest score? Let's run a comp to see the, the rankings that need to speed and all that stuff. And um, now I want to work out, you know, what areas that these dudes have to improve, or boys, girls, whatever. Um, okay, and then, okay, what's going on here is, you know, you're going in so hard to the corner, it's a slippery surface, so, you know, it's the friction thing, so how do you get the feel of that? And, you know, it's, kids, and you can... they can use all those transferable skills, perhaps, yeah. there are transferable yeah. skills. It's like when, you, when you've got really young kids before they're smart enough to realise, when you make cleaning their room again, yeah. you know, they don't realise that. Once they get to about six, it's unless they're paid with cash incentive, they won't do it, but, you know, there's... You know, it's sort of making it inclusive and engaging. But again, I think I talked about it at the start. If it's fun and engaging, and you know, if you're learning when you don't feel like you're learning, I mean, because too often, you know, you, you, you know, we, I see even the stuff that they teach you know, my kids and stuff in math. So I mean, I do find that the kids who come out of uni these days are so much better prepared than we were, because there tends to be more immersive, active, doing learning as opposed to some obscure case study that means nothing with all this theory that has, you know, I. I dropped out of science in Form 4, but now all I read about is social insects and complex adaptive systems and shit like that because there was a context for me. But beforehand, there was a, I, mean, I don't care if, or, or, or I can make iron filings fizz up and stuff. That was exciting, or I can make a Coke bottle go funny if I put aspirins in it or drink it even better. Um, the, uh, but yeah, you know what I mean? It's, the, yeah, it's sort of making it less dry and engaging, and, but also letting them take it somewhere. Because that's the other thing we often find with a lot of the social stuff. At, at Deloitte we run this reverse mentoring stuff where it's a bit like the younger people have to teach the older people about the value of social networks and social capital and how to get value from it. And that's a massive thing for staff. You know, in your old apprenticeship hierarchy model was, you know, the, the master teaches the new staff member. Now it's a bit like, well, I know some, you know some stuff, but I know a whole heap of other stuff you don't. So it's two-way learning has, has become massive for us even culturally. I better shut up because I can go on for another week. <laughs> All right. Thank you.